again, I'm very grateful to be here to be able to have this opportunity to review the book. Um, knowledge, they always say, is power. Most of us are what we are by the power of knowledge acquired over the years. So you are a doctor today because you went to a med school, you read medicine, all the things that you did have brought you to where you are today. So knowledge has always been the most powerful thing on earth. That's why they say if you want to keep the people perpetually down and poor, you know, deny them the ability to acquire the knowledge they need to lift themselves. Um, we all know the story, keeping people um, down, but improving on what you know. And that's why this John Maxwell's book is very, very exciting. He only wrote this book last year in the midst of the pandemic, leading in tough times. And maybe um, he had the pandemic in mind when he was writing the book, because indeed a lot of people did face tough time during the pandemic. And I give you this quote. It's a quote that has been attributed to many people, but no matter who owns the quote, I think it's very relevant. It's be kind for everyone you meet. Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. There are countless challenges surrounding us as a community, as a family, as a business, as organization. People are going through a lot. In the last two years, we had the global pandemic that shut down most of the world. And everybody will have thought that the pandemic was the biggest issue affecting everybody. But there are so many families that were going through so many other things that was totally unrelated to the pandemic, but that was their struggle. And in the midst of that struggle, they needed leadership. So leading people in situations and you know, in circumstances where times are tough and challenging has always been one difficult aspect. And I think John Maxwell captures it very well in his book. You know, when he speaks about leadership in crisis time, he said disaster can make or break a leader. In tough times, some leaders have risen up to the challenge, leading their employees, their children, community, their students, keeping them informed, managing the primary and the secondary effect of everything they are going through the economic destructions that they have to go through. So leaders always rise up in times of crisis. But one thing was very clear that he said. He said in times of crisis, leadership must be very, very clear on communication. He said the best practice for communication during, leader, during crisis period is to be transparent, to be honest, and to show empathy. Transparent, honest, and to show empathy. Those are the best things you can do for your people when there's a um, leadership crisis or when there's a crisis in the nation. John Maxwell divides this book into seven. Chapters. He gives a lot of wisdom, a lot of wisdom nuggets that he shared, which is very essential. He describes the values that are important to leadership. In chapter two, he talks about change, that you must be a change agent if you are to lead people successfully in tough times. In chapter three, he talks about teamwork. That teamwork is important and is the bedrock for connecting people together, that for people to succeed in tough times, they need to work together as a team. And we've often had this saying that united we stand, divided we fall. Communi communities that hold together strive better in challenging times. And so we need that connection to be able to make impact. Then in chapter four, he talks about motivation ability to inspire your team to excellence. He said something in that book that I like to quote. He says, successful leaders do daily what unsuccessfully, what unsuccessful people do occasionally. So it must be a way of life. You must be consistent and you must be 
focused on what you are doing. Working on building trust. You must practice the golden rule, he said. In chapter five, he talks about the strategy challenge. You must have a strategy for getting your people through the tough times. So the book is simply put. In chapter six, it talks about communication, that you must communicate. So you have gotten your people right, you've gotten the motivation, then you must be able to communicate those ideas, you know, succinctly to the people. And they must understand it the way it is intended to be. Then on chapter seven, he talks about decision-making, that there are different types of decision-making you will face as a leader when things are in, when we are leading in crisis period or we are leading in tough times. Uh, he starts the book with an introduction. Before we go into the chapter by chapter um, thing, I'll just take snippet from the book. Um, if you want to get the whole gist, I recommend you get a copy from Lantana. I don't think it's a very expensive book. The entire book is about 129 pages, you know, um, sorry, 132 pages. Um, easy to read. Um, I read it in a day and a half, you know, um, which, which was not very difficult. But he starts with an introduction and he says in tough time, the people we lead will find out who we are. He said, we ourselves will discover who we are. Otto Jack Kenda says that you are not made in crisis situation. You are revealed when there's a crisis. He says, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. When you squeeze a lemon, you get lemon juice. He said, when you squeeze a human being, what you get is what is inside him. So it's not the day that you need to be tough, that you need to go and buy toughness and drink. You need to have prepared ahead of time. So he says the best way to approach tough times is to see them as opportunities. When you want to show how good you are, you look for a challenge that you solve. You look for a problem to fix. Look for opportunity, your skill, and what you can do. He said most people want things to be fixed for them, done for them. He said, but that's not how things work. But as a leader, as a coach, as a father, as a mentor, as a manager, as a church leader, wherever you are, you act as a catalyst, a turnaround agent for your people. They need to see that you have that passion to drive them through this thing that they are going through. So you must necessarily take responsibility. When things are going wrong, that's why people keep calling. Things are not going well in this country, we call the president. If things are not going well in a home, the father is often called, why? Because he's the head of the family. If an organization is doing well, the person they really remember is the managing director. Not minding that the people who are really doing the job are down there, the factory workers. Why? Because he takes responsibility for whatever happens, good or bad. So you say, as a leader, you must take responsibility. You must lead the people in such a way that they develop confidence. And he speaks about seven things that he recommends how to serve your people in difficult times. And I will run through them quickly. Number one, he said you must define reality. Peter Drunker in one of his books says, a time of turbulence is a dangerous time, but it's the greatest danger the temptation to deny the reality of what you are going through. So you must define reality for them. If you had a family that you were um, traveling once a year, twice a year, maybe things have become tough and it's not going to work again. You have to sit down and let them know why you cannot make that travel. In Nigeria today, a lot of companies I hear are having to slash their working time. Why? Because the price of diesel has gone up. And you have to have that conversation with your people. We cannot own generator from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. anymore. People are even having shifts to come to work. People are working on half pay. Why is the leader's responsibility to define reality and let the people know, be clear about where we are? This is the situation we have found ourselves. That's the reality of what it is. Having done that, the next thing he says is that you must show them the big picture. So where are we going? We are taking this temporary heat because it's the reality of our situation, but this is where we are going. You must paint a vivid picture 
of where they are going in such a way that they'll be ready to follow you even if they do not see the whole picture. Why? Because they believe you. So you must be very clear. Number three is that you must help them develop a plan. You know that was you must have a strategy to get from where you are to that big picture you are showing them. So you have defined reality for them. This is where we are. This is what is happening. Now to get from where we are to where we are going, this is what we must necessarily do. What is it that you want to do? You must show them that, that this is where we are going. Develop a plan of action. Number four is that you must make, help them make the right choices. There are so many voices that will be coming up. There will be so many strategies, but they always say the box stops at the table, at the table of the leader. That's why everything good or bad, they say everything falls and rises with leadership. You must help them make the right choices, determine where to go. Are we to go left? Are we to go right? Are we to cut here or are we to cut there? That is the job of leadership. Don't vacillate. Don't outsource that decision making. Don't say I have empowered my managers. The responsibility still lies with you. And then number five, he says you must value and promote teamwork. When times are tough, tendency is that people want to go into their own cocoon. And we are even seeing that in Nigeria today. Things are difficult, so people, ref people revert to their natural default lines of either ethnicity, religion, tribe, brother, nepotism. Why? Because things are tough and challenging. Resources are scarce. But the job of a leader is to promote teamwork. Show them that together we are stronger and we can pull through these tough times. And then number six, you say you must give them hope. There must be something to hope for. There must be a hope that we have a better future, a better tomorrow. So it's not always enough as a leader to, to, to just paint the picture, but you must show them hope. Hope is the foundation of change. If people have nothing to hope for, then they are unlikely to change what they are doing today because they don't think that tomorrow will be better. But if we hold hope very high, then we help them to do the same. And there's always a chance that they will move forward and they will succeed. So those are the six things he said we must do. Quickly, broke down the things, and I won't go through this too much. He talks about self-leadership. You must be able to lead yourself. The first step that you must be able to what? Lead yourself very well. Knowing yourself as a leader, what works best for you, what is most effective and what's most efficient is great. And that's the chapter one of the book, talking about self-leadership. And there are a few things he spoke about self-leadership, that you must seek wisdom and wins. Spend time with people who increase your courage. As a leader, if you want to be able to, and I'm just taking snippet from the book, this is not all. If you want to get the full gist of the book, you have to get the book and read it, okay? so. A bit of snippets here and there. He says, spend time with people who increase your courage. Many times leaders lack that courage and they are not able to do the things they need to do. You need courage. Number two, he says, find ways to get a few wins under your belt. If you win, it helps you to win more. Victory attracts more victory. I mean, one success brings more success. So think of the past where you have been successful, where you have done something that brought you that win that you needed. Number three, he says, quit comparing yourself to others. Comparison weakens courage rather than strengthening it. It's called comparison is very, very hard of social media. A lot of people are posting only the positives on social media. And so if you are not a strong and tenacious leader or your people are not, they see what other people are posting. And those of us that have children can relate to that. You know, when people are always posting the best of themselves. So I was talking about the change 
chapter two deals with the change challenge, all right? That as a leader in tough time, embrace positive change. Even when it is difficult and they cannot see when they're in their comfort zone, you need to help them get results. Even when they worry that it might not work or it is not possible. So you must be that change agent. And a few things listed that you need to do. You must find common grounds. Common grounds means relationship, attitude, and communication are key to finding common grounds. What is it that you people align and work together on? That's why sometimes in a country like Nigeria, we say, let us look at the commonality of the things that unite us rather than the things that divide us. So when the lady won the 100 meters hurdle, for example, in the World Athletics Championship, it was a common ground that united the whole country. Nobody cared where she come, came from. Everybody was rejoicing because a Nigerian had won something. That's always very important in a time of crisis. And number two, he says, change what needs to be changed, not what is easy to change. Introduce changes that make a difference or significant impact and not mere cosmetic ones or with ones with low impact. Change what needs to be changed, not what is easy to be changed. I've seen that those of you that have worked in corporate organizations will discover that whenever there's a crisis in corporate organization and they are rationalizing staff or workers, they go and gather some 200 low level staff, 50 low level staff and disengage them. And people will say all these 50 people is what one manager at the top, that why sacrifice all these people? Number three, say let go of yesterday so that you can move forward into tomorrow. Especially because of the speed of change in today's technological world. People who work in the tech area accept that they must let go of yesterday and embrace the change for the sake of tomorrow. Bill Gates, co-founder and CEO of Microforce, once said, he says, in three years, every product our company makes today will be obsolete. He said, the only question is, are we the ones that will make it obsolete or will someone else? So when you see iPhone 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, every year iPhone is coming out. It's because they want to stay ahead of the curve. If they don't, somebody else will make them obsolete. Even if it's just one or two features they add to it, they keep doing it. You must be at the cutting edge of innovation. Communicate the change with simplicity and power. Activate the belief in the people. Remove barriers for them to be able to see where we are going. And then you must do these things quickly. Chapter three, he talks about the teamwork challenge. Building and improving your team is a must. It's what must happen. You must build and improve your team. Do not leave it to chance. You see, if you want to succeed in tough time, you need a good team that can deliver on what you are looking at to achieve. You need the right people in the right place doing the right things together. So as a leader, it's your responsibility to facilitate these things. Place high premium on your team members. Understand each team member. There's a particular quote I would like to say. He says, people are insecure. Give them confidence. People are selfish. Speak to their needs first. People want to feel special. Sincerely compliment them. He said, people desire a better tomorrow. Show them hope. People get emotionally low. Encourage them. People want to be associated with success, help them win. And you will get these people to deliver no matter what you are doing. Number three says, give respect freely. Respect each team member, value their opinions. Don't disregard anybody. Number four, he says, make other people's agenda your priority. So in tough times, it's very important to know what your people are going through. In things not related to the job, Somebody may be struggling. They may have somebody that has a health challenge. If you are only concerned about the job they are doing for you, they are unlikely to give you their 100%. But if you value them and know what they are going through in their personal life, whether it's a house rent, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a child school fees, whether it's, it's, it's uh, whatever it is they are going through, just try to empathize with that situation with them. And then finally, under teamwork, you say you must commit yourself to grow as a team. 
you must commit yourself to grow as a team. Don't leave anything to chance. The teamwork challenge. Teamwork. Yes. Also, yeah, great. So finally, let me just talk about the motivation challenge also. I think that's in chapter four. You say inspiring your team to excellence. Tough times can be discouraging. People can lose confidence and start believing the worst about themselves and their teams and their circumstances. Why? Because of what they are going through. He says, during such times, your job as a leader is to motivate your team to keep them moving forward. In spite of the obstacle on their path, you must be a motivator. A strong leader is a good motivator. Not only do you have the responsibility for their success as a team, you must show them how to do it. You must stay positive, even when you are going through your own challenges yourself. And he says, how do you do this? He said, look for motivated people around you. Don't look for people that sap your energy. There are people that when they come into a room, when they hear a challenge, they have entered the solution mode. Sparkling solution in their heads are coming up all the time. And so they have just entered that mode. So you must look for such people to work with. Share your passion with them. Paint a picture of a better tomorrow. Show them how their role is making a difference. You know, I had a story once of a man that was fixing boat on, the, um, on a Boeing aircraft. And the owner of the aircraft came in and said, hey man, what are you doing there? And he told the CEO and said, look, I am helping to develop an aircraft safe enough to carry my wife and my family from point A to point B. He understood, even though he was just tying boats. So if you are cleaning in an office, how is the value of that job you are doing in that office related to the overall objective of that company you are working on? They must know how they relate. Reward them appropriately. A lot of people like to be rewarded differently. Know what motivates your people. Know what sign of reward. Some people like letters. I've been to people's offices, even letters that were written of commendation. They have framed it and put it on the wall best salesman of the month. A lot of people frame it and put. Some people value that more than cash. In today's world, a lot of people value cash though. But know how your people love to be rewarded and reward them appropriately. Challenge them to keep growing. Nelson Jackson says, I do not believe you can do today's job with yesterday's skills, method, and be in business tomorrow. Company and people need to grow to stay relevant. The next thing is, he talks about the strategy challenge, I think in chapter six, no, in chapter five. He said, you must have a strategy for what you want to do. You must have a strategy. Don't underestimate the challenges you are dealing with and you shouldn't overestimate them either. Don't wait for the challenge to be solved, to solve itself. Sometimes people just think that things will go away. We're having a security challenge in Nigeria. We've had meetings after meetings. It's not going to just go away. There must be concrete action taken. Things must be done. He says, don't be ashamed to ask for help. Lift up your hand. If you have reached your wit's end, raise up your hand and say, I need help. That could be a strategy. And sit down and agree on what to do. Martin Harrison observed, he said, when you step into a turnaround situation, you can safely assume four things. Number one, the morale of people are low. Fear is high. Good people are halfway out of the door. Slackers are hiding behind the scene. You require intentional problem solving skills as a leader to get all these people out and get them into place. Number six, communication. You must communicate. I mean, we can't overstate the value of communication in everything that we do. Communication is very, very important. You must let the people know where you are going, what you are doing. Communicate with honesty, with passion, with integrity, the people will listen to you. Don't leave them in the dark. In communication, he talks about listening. You shouldn't be the only one talking. Listen to the voices from below. They live inside the problem. They have the solution inside their head and they are likely to tell you what to do that will work. Be open-minded. Don't interrupt people, don't shut them down. Listen to understand and see what they are saying. And you will get good feedback. Finally, he talks about decision making. Decision making is very, very important also. 
you must have the courage to make the right decision. Courageous decision, what must be done? Priority decision, what must be done first? Change decision, what must be done differently? Creative decision, what might be possible? Then people decision, who should or should not be involved? You must know all those things. Remember, what's at stake in decision making is that you must see the long-term benefit to the team. The stakes are usually higher in times of crisis. Leaders' competence and integrity is called to question and tested. You must make the right decision. And finally, before I open it up for question, I have this final words also from the book. It says, crisis offer the opportunity to be reborn. Difficult times can discipline us to become stronger. Conflict can actually renew our chances of building better, stronger companies, countries, families, relationships, and everything. When you have gone through a war, Rwanda is a classic example. Rwanda went through a war that the whole world, but if you go to Rwanda today, they are arguably the fastest and best growing country in Africa. They went through a crisis. And when they came out of there and they had a strong and purposeful leader, it has given them that opportunity to build a better, stronger nation. It's not always easy to do all these things, but these things you must remember. It says everything, everything rises and fall on leadership. If you've been trusted to lead your people, you have an opportunity to raise the people up through tough times. So I'll be happy to take questions. The leadership challenge is a big one, but you must rise to the occasion. So the book is a very, very easy, nice to read book, um, 32 pages. You can read it in a day if you are fast, two days if you are not too fast. If you're a slow reader, you can take one week just digesting everything. So thank you very much, Pastor Benga. Uh, I hand over to you again. Thank you.